Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Oak Tree TV. I'm Dave Kemp and today I'm joined by Nick Reed. Nick, say hello. Hi Dave, thanks for having me on. Thanks for being here. So Nick is with Johns Hopkins University. Um, he is an assistant professor there and the reason I wanted to bring him on today is that at Johns Hopkins they're doing a lot of research around age-related hearing loss and they're doing so through a public health lens. And so I think that their research is pretty fascinating. And so Nick, let's start with, you know, you speaking to this research around um, the geriatric outcomes that come with age-related hearing loss. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's really nice because it complements audiology really well to focus on the public health side of this. You know, in audiology, and, and I'm an audiologist by training, so I care about this a lot, we focus a lot on the immediate outcomes where we look at, you know, hearing loss and communication or hearing loss and hearing aids and how you're, you're satisfied with those hearing aids. But in our lab, we tend to focus on sort of the, the big picture outcomes like cognitive decline, dementia, depression, social isolation, uh, loneliness, healthcare resource utilization. And these are sort of the things that, that gerontologic uh, focused researchers really, really care about. And so I think the one that usually catches a lot of attention is, uh, is the cognitive decline in dementia. Um, and so our lab is uh, headed up by Frank Lynn, who sort of spearheaded some of this research on the epidemiologic scale. I think there's several people within audiology who had been studying this um, on a more focused, uh, perhaps neurologic scale for quite a while. Um, but what Frank's research shows is you know, in general, people with hearing loss have a faster rate of cognitive decline compared to those without hearing loss, and that's when you control for other factors related to cognitive decline, like age, race, sex, hypertension, stroke. Um, you know, same thing with they have a um, higher incidence of dementia, and so sort of what that means is, you know, one of his more classic studies and from our lab is. We had 600 or so older adults in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging, and we followed them over sort of a 12-year period. And at baseline, none of these adults had dementia. And then over this 12-year period, those with mild hearing loss, just defined as a four-frequency, better ear, pure tone average, mild hearing loss, they had two-fold risk of developing dementia compared to those without hearing loss. When we went to moderate hearing loss, they had threefold risk, and those with severe hearing loss actually had a five-fold risk of developing dementia over this period. Now, you know, that five-fold risk is a little bit high, and I always caution people to interpret the studies uh, appropriately. There were very few people with severe hearing loss, so that number may be inflated for what the reality is there. Um, but in general, you do see in sort of larger studies uh, those with moderate hearing loss having, you know, we see a dose response, those with moderate and severe hearing loss having a higher risk, essentially, of developing dementia than those with moderate hear or mild hearing loss or no hearing loss at all. Um, we also look at, like I said, health resource utilization, and we just produced a study not that long ago where we looked at people over a 10-year period, and what we saw is those with hearing loss compared to those without, uh, and we, we matched, so we matched about 150,000 adults with and without hearing loss on each side of this study and looked at claims data. Uh, those with hearing loss spent on average about $22,000 more uh, in healthcare spending, and that's after removing anything related directly to hearing loss compared to those without hearing loss. Uh, they also had a 44% higher risk of having a 30-day readmission. Uh, they had a 46% higher rate of hospitalization, 17% higher risk of emergency department visit. So in general, we're seeing people with hearing loss, older adults with hearing loss, really using healthcare much more and, and more likely to spend more on healthcare. And this, this could be some of the comorbidities we see, like dementia. We know dementia is expensive. Uh, it could also be that people with hearing loss fundamentally interact with the healthcare system differently, such that patient-provider communication is somewhat blocked and they're having a harder time getting to their diagnosis and, and being satisfied with their treatment and, and even really succeeding with their treatment. So yeah. No, I think that's really interesting. And, you know, like as we continue to have an aging population, I think I saw that every day um, you have 10,000 Americans that uh, turn the age of 65. So 
all of the baby boomer generation is um, it's getting older um, life expectancy just continues to grow so the thought is that we're going to all live longer and we know that one of the biggest indicators of hearing loss tends to be age and so everything that you're speaking to i think makes a whole lot of sense um, and i think is just more and more relevant to the way that the world is kind of going so let me ask you um, what is through the research um, what have you found to be the impact of treating your hearing loss on some of these different outcomes that you've mentioned? That's, that is the million dollar question. And I wish I had some, you know, golden answer for you. And, you know, this is kind of a good opportunity to sort of uh, educate, uh, I, think, I think the general public even a little bit of why we can't just take a study and then look at those who have hearing aids and say, well, what's, you know, how do they do? And the problem is in secondary data, where you have this big data set and you've been following people for a long time, uh, the people with hearing aids usually have the means to buy hearing aids, they have better health insurance, the, uh, they're also more conscious of their health, they're more likely to go get them, uh, perhaps they have higher health literacy. Those all happen to be also protective factors for things like cognitive decline and dementia. So we really can't parse apart that data, and what we need are large-scale randomized control trials. Um, and I am happy to report that we do currently have one underway. We have the ACHIEVE trial, um, and it's run out of Johns Hopkins, but it's run at four sites throughout the country. There's one in Maryland, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And we're actually looking at whether or not you treat hearing loss whether this delays cognitive decline. So we're looking over a three to five year period, and then we're con using a control where uh, they're not getting a placebo, they're actually getting sort of an equivalent aging um, intervention where they see a nurse and they actually sort of focus on some age-related outcomes like you know staying physically active, reducing smoking, improving diet. So they're actually getting a treatment as well, and we're comparing uh, treating hearing loss, best practice hearing loss treatment to that. Um, there are some studies, too, I, I should caution that some people have done a good job of, of really doing um, strong methodolo uh, methodologic intervention, or not intervention, but uh, analysis looking within subject with secondary data. So what they've done is, um, I'm thinking of Piers Dawes work, actually, over a long period of time, he's looked at a specific set of people, just those who got hearing aids. And what you see is that over this long period of time, the point at which they receive hearing aids sort of the slope of their cognitive decline does sort of change, which suggests that hearing aids are protective then of, for, to some degree, right? If you're, if you're sort of delaying at this sort of rapid pace, partially because of your hearing loss, and then you get hearing aids and your, your rate of decline sort of slows down a little bit, that's, that's sort of a positive marker that may suggest uh, hearing aids are protective. And, and that would be, you know, that would be fantastic if we have uh, if we have something that prevents dementia or slows cognitive decline later in life, oh, that's, that's sort of amazing because there's no magic pill for that right now. Uh, and hearing loss is, you know, it happens later in life so we can treat it at that late time point. The other sort of successful interventions for delaying dementia, there are things that have to happen in your 20s and 30s, things like uh, better exercise, better diet, you know, higher education. There are things that have to happen early in life. You can't just change and flip a switch in your 60s. Whereas with hearing loss, just based on the biologic you know, uh, mechanism of age-related hearing loss, we could treat it later in life and we could make a difference. And that would be, that would be a real boon to society to know that. I completely agree. I think it's pretty amazing. And I think it just goes to show that um, you know, I think that everybody in this industry understands that hearing loss is so much more than just losing your ability to hear, right? And all of these different comorbidities that you guys are researching to see what the real effects are, I think really play into this. I mean, it's just common sense that, uh, you know, if you lose your hearing, you're going to be more socially isolated. You're gonna, it's gonna have a toll um, on your mental health. And I, I think all of these things are just evidence that treating your hearing loss is, it's so much more and it goes so much more beyond um, just the fact of being able to hear again, as important as that is too. So let's just close up here um, uh, with the question I have here, which is um, how do you effectively address all of this through community intervention? Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's you know, also a million dollar question. I, 
Um, so what our lab does is, you know, we spend a lot of time, you know, in public health in general. So in medicine and audiology, we kind of use a medical model, right? We, we bring people in. Uh, we treat hearing loss with best practice intervention, and we sort of treat them one individual at a time. And public health tends to focus instead on how can we leverage policy, how can we leverage the community, how can we leverage the current healthcare system to develop new models to treat more people. And in audiology, this is quite relevant. You know, we know that the data shows somewhere between only 20 to maybe on the high end, 40% of adults with hearing loss actually have hearing aids. Um, and perhaps even less of them that uh, actually use them. So a lot of times they end up in the drawer. So we clearly have some issues. And, and in audiology, I think we know that those, those in the drawer hearing aids, a lot of times, you know, it's uh, with best practice, best counseling, we know that we can get them, you know, we can get them on a successful track. Uh, so, so what our lab does is we try to complement the, the current model of audiology by introducing things like community-based intervention. Carrie Neiman leads a study where she uses community healthcare workers uh, to basically go into senior living communities, talk about hearing loss, um, help sort of get them uh, on the path where they need to be, and then use over-the-counter devices uh, at this state and time, PSAPs, but perhaps in the future after the, um, the FDA finishes their regulations, uh, perhaps an actual over OTC hearing aid. Uh, and just getting people a basic device and giving them the education about using that device. Um, she spends a lot of time thinking about the idea that, you know, for an older adult, a manual should be large pictures. It should have, you know, high contrast text. Um, it should be very low health literacy. So it should be written at maybe a second or third grade level so that they can read it simply. Uh, and then instead of just sort of leaving them with the device, her community health care workers actually focus on sort of like best practice communication, things like, hey, you know, you have to get your friend's attention first before you can even talk to them, or you should move away from noise. And these sound really simple, but they go a long way in sort of maximizing the benefit of a device. Um, and then she sort of uh, rounds everything off with, she actually turns all of her um, participants into teachers later on. You know, they teach their friends and their, their peers best practice hearing care, essentially, at a basic community level. And so we can do this with an ENT or an audiologist sort of at the top of the pyramid, and then these community health care workers out there in the field making a difference. Um, and it, it allows us to basically, instead of, you know, one audiologist seeing 30 people a day max, and that's, that's if you're seeing people in, like, 15-minute increments, um, you could see hundreds of people a day if you're leveraging community health care workers. No, I think that's fascinating, and you, I, you know, I think the optimistic argument for OTC is that if it's done right, kind of to your point, I think if more people are exposed to just the improvement in the higher quality of life that can come when you start to treat your hearing loss, um, I think it's just a, it's going to be a massive boon to the whole industry, to the profession, to everyone, because I think you're going to have more people. Um, coming around to accepting that they have this and that it's definitely something that's worth treating. So I think that all the research that you guys are doing is fascinating. I'm you know, really excited to um, bring you back on in the future so that you can share updates with what you guys are seeing in the data and you know, kind of keep the professionals informed here. So Nick, thank you so much for taking the time here to speak with me and to uh, educate you know, the whole um, professional community in what Johns Hopkins is doing uh, around all this research. It's been great, so thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Absolutely, so cheers everybody. We'll see you next week.